All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for joining us here and welcome to today's webinar where we unpack the federal funding to ARENA for round one of the community battery program. First point of business, I'm going to go through our housekeeping for today. So this webinar will run for about 90 minutes, give or take, depending on the Q&A at the end. Uh, this will be recorded and each person who registered will receive a copy as well as the slides from each presenter. Once the presentations are complete, we will go into our Q&A where we expect there will be a strong number of questions because we have close to 300 people registered here today. Very, very topical. And with regards to those questions, uh, we do have representatives from each company uh, as panelists in the background. So if you have any quick questions that you want answered, you can put that into the chat and they will answer them on the go. If you have any direct questions to one of our presenters, please put that into the Q&A and we will get to those at the end. Today's webinar is being hosted by Supply Partners. My name is Wade Allen, and I am the National Technical Manager here at Supply Partners. If you have any questions outside of this webinar, please email us through at support at supplypartners.com.au, and we will make sure to address your needs there. And to keep the lawyers happy and to have everybody's expectations in check, we do have a disclaimer. So the discussion and information provided here in today's webinar is not an official prescription for ARENA grant funding and is for information purposes only. It does not constitute any form of professional advice, financial or otherwise, addressing your specific circumstances. It is intended to be an informative coaching session, and if you have more in-depth and direct questions regarding the program, we recommend you reach out directly to ARENA or consult your own professional advisor. That being said, what is the purpose and focus of today's webinar? It is to help you submit a successful expression of interest for round one funding of the Arena Community Battery Program. I want to reiterate that this is not the full application phase. This is only the expression of interest phase, which could include just things like letters of intent from your customers. So full commitment and deposits are not required at this stage. It is just the expression of interest phase. And we do know that the timing of this application phase is quite tight. And that's the reason for this webinar to help simplify it because applications are due in at the end of this month. We are gonna break it down into five simple steps. So what to look for, how to filter down and find the right projects. Number two, how to analyze the data to determine its feasibility. Number three, how to add value to the battery to make that revenue model stack up. Number four, how to accurately estimate the costs associated with those products, projects. And number five, the preparation of the application. Now, each presenter will touch on one or more of these processes, which will hopefully clear away the mud so it doesn't bog you down and waste your time. And we will hope to have a nice, clear pathway for a successful application. We will also be providing you with a matchmaking service if you don't have all the five necessary sites required per application. So what is the Coles notes of the round one funding? Well, ARENA has released $120 million into two streams, and each one of those streams gets 50% of the funding. Stream A is for DNSPs only. There is a list of those DNSPs in the appendix of their guideline document on their website. Stream B is what we are going to be focusing on today, and is basically everyone that isn't a DNSP and who is eligible under the Advanced Renewable Program. That's people that have an ABN or an Australian entity or your local government or council. Each application must have at least five different sites with one battery in each, so a minimum of five batteries. This is because the whole purpose of this funding is an exercise in the deployment of at least 342 batteries. Each application must be worth at least 3 million in grant funding with a maximum of 20 million. Now the funding can include up to 100% of the battery capex costs, and that can include things like the battery itself, obviously, the inverters, any ancillary equipment, earthworks, construction, installation costs, IT systems. However, the funding will not cover development and other soft costs. And what is important, and I want you to remember this, is a three to one ratio. 
that three to one ratio is those soft costs versus the funding costs. So if you're your application is worth $3 million in funding. That means the total cost of all five products projects must be at least $12 million or around $2.5 million per site. So these are big, big sites. So perhaps look at this as a 25% discount on your projects. Now, projects can be front of the meter or behind the meter. However, today we will be focusing on behind the meter as they are much faster and much easier to deal with and your projects must hit the mark on the objectives and outcomes of the program, which we will, we will be discussing today in the presentations. Now, as mentioned previously, today's webinar is being hosted and brought to you by Supply Partners. We are a 100% Australian-owned national distributor of solar and energy storage equipment, and we've been doing so for over 10 years. We pride ourselves on not just being box movers. We provide the industry with sales and technical support and training now, which is exactly what we're doing here today, bringing this webinar to you. We have warehouses across Australia, and we partner with only proven and trusted manufacturers so that our customers have the confidence to partner with us, knowing that we have done the due diligence for them. So our four presenters for today from VPP Partners, we have the Director of Business Development and Partnerships, also their co-founder, Mark Neto, from Orchestra, co-founder and co-CEO, James Alston. Then I will reappear for my presentation. And last but not least from Evergen, we have the Head of C&I and Utility Scale, Mr. Rakesh Martin. Our timeline for today will look like this. Our first 15 minute presentation will be from VPP Partners. Now VPP Partners provides analytical, technical, engineering, and operational support for your energy business to accelerate your sales, time to market, and improve your business, business efficiencies, similar to helping you put in an application for Arena. Today they're here to give a presentation on, once you know it, how to successfully apply to Arena for Round 1 funding. How fortuitous for us. We will then have Orchestra present. Now, Orchestra, as you know, has reinvented feasibility analysis for behind-the-meter and front-of-the-meter energy products. Their cloud-based solution can do in minutes what used to take overpriced consultants weeks to accomplish. They really have changed the game for us. Today, James will be presenting on the what and how of modeling community batteries for round one. Then back to supply partners, whom I've already spoken their praises, will present on the ideal battery solutions for this round of funding. And rounding up our presentations will be Evergen. Now, Evergen provides a software platform that enables digital optimization of the energy supply chain. This will maximize the benefit from deploying renewable technologies. Basically, they make that battery sing. Rakesh will be presenting on the operational control and monetization of community batteries. And at the end, as mentioned, we will finish with any questions that have not been answered in the chat and those directed at the presenters in the Q&A. So without further ado, I will pass the conch on to Mr. Mark Neto from VPP Partners, so he can shed some light for us surrounding how we can put together a successful application. Mark? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully, uh, VPP Partners can do what Wade said and help you to understand what is required to go into one of these applications. So before I jump in, let me introduce myself again, Mark Neto, um, Director of Business Development and Partnerships. Uh, and as Wade, Wade said, we typically help fast growing new energy companies accelerate their business efficiencies and time to market. And we've come up with five simple steps for you to follow and a few different templates that you can use that should help you throughout the process. So, um, First off, before we start, let me just define what a community battery is. Uh, a community battery sits between 50 kilowatts and 5 megawatts. So that sits between residential batteries and utility scale batteries. They're usually grid connected and at the distribution level. Now they should deliver benefits to the community, 
to both the community, the network, but also the broader market. And by broader market, what we mean is um, they should help lower household energy costs, increase grid reliability, and enable more renewable energy, therefore decreasing emissions. So we're starting to see a boom in utility scale batteries, and we're also seeing a boom in residential scale batteries. Um, and because these sit in between, um, Arena really wants to find out if this is the solution to cover the middle ground that's required through this energy transition. So Arena has got a fund of 120 million, and they're looking to fund projects between 3 million and 20 million each. Now, round one objective. So this EOI, this is round one, uh, which closes, as Wade said, on the 30th of June, 2023. Um, round two is expected to be announced later this year. So if at the end of this webinar, you find that you're not ready or maybe don't have the partners, first of all, you can reach out to us. But otherwise, there's always the second round for you to apply to. Now, what Arena really wants to do is to find out what it's going to take for these sized batteries to scale, right? They want to see the same trajectory they're seeing on residential batteries as well as utility scale batteries, but at this mid-size level. Um, and they're hoping to learn to learn how to do this through this grant. So three things that they want. Um, they want to prove, it, they want to show that you can uh, inc improve the economics of the community battery projects or remove barriers to large scale deployment. They want to increase the capability that's needed to deploy these batteries. And three, um, because they're sort of government supported, they want to see if they can meet the objectives of the recent budget, which is putting downward pressure on household electricity costs and enabling more solar connected to the grid. So let me get into what you need to do for this um, application. Now, the bare minimum that you need to submit to Arena would be a business model. You need five suitable sites. You need partners or key stakeholders for the project. Um, and these could include the community as well, as they are community batteries. You'll need to fund the project. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not sure what's happened there. Yeah, I might have hit the hit one of the buttons there. Sorry about that. So you'll need to um, ensure you have all the relevant stakeholders, including the community. You need to fund the project. Um, and in order to get funding, you need to design a solution uh, and understand how the financials work. Then last but not least, you'll need someone to write the plan and the submission, and you'll need someone to lead the program post EOI. Okay, and this is the bare minimum. So if, if you had all of these, here, yeah, you would qualify for the, you, you would meet all of the merits required. Now, if you want to get to the front of the queue, you need to have something a little bit more. There might be many applications for this, uh, for this grant. And Arena is going to really want to see something a little bit more than just the bare minimum. For that, you should be thinking about an interesting angle. So something maybe that's aligned with one of the new government initiatives that, that have been announced recently, or something that gives back to, a, to the community in a way that's different from all of the other applications. It has to be accountable, but different. And last but definitely not least, you should be able to show how this scales. Okay, so that's a little bit about the grant. Now, I've got a few different examples of um, possible solutions that you could put forward. Now, I know this is a busy slide, so let me just take you through what we have here. On the left, at the top of the slide here, we've got an example of what that um, solution could look like. We've got a project complex complexity score. We have the type of projects, uh, types of sites that you require, example funding, and then we've got a checklist of stakeholders that you might have to get involved or uh, sorry, as well as revenue models and the arena and community requirements. So this is really a template that you can use to see if you have all of the elements that you need for your project. 
So let me jump into the first one. I've got three of these to show you. The first one's a vanilla behind the meter example. And um, it is probably the easiest of the examples that I have here. So if you're you know, thinking, noting that we've only got four weeks to put a submission in, if you haven't already started, this is probably the example that you want to lead out with. Um, so there's two options that you could have here. The first one, which is the easiest, is if you found a building that was a community type building. So a school, a swimming pool, um, maybe a hospital that already had solar and you installed a behind the meter battery. And this has to be a battery that's behind a on-market child meter. Now, if you're not sure what that is, uh, don't worry. Someone else on the rest or on this webinar is going to explain that to you, probably Rakesh, when he talks about it. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is you will have to have partners for this project and you will have to have various stakeholders. And one of these stakeholders should have the answers that you need. So if you're not sure about anything, just reach out to the people on this call uh, and the stakeholders that you might be introduced to. Now, this type of project, you would probably need a community group. You would need a location for the battery. So you need five, five different sites. You will need an asset developer, a market participant. And this is the person who would understand how that battery should be located behind a meter. And you will need some financing. Um, the easiest to go for, and I think uh, some of the other speakers on this webinar are also going to touch on this particular example. Now I'll move on to the second example. This is a co-located utility battery. It's slightly more complex than the last one, um, but still quite easy to do. So for a project like this, you'd have to identify a solar farm, get a battery installed on that solar farm, and uh, you would have revenue access through the wholesale market or FGAS. Um, relatively easy to do. One thing to note though is if, if this solar farm already has a, um, an offtake with a retailer, so if you do have a retailer involved, then it might be a good way to think about a community retail plan. And so this is you know, something that it's, it's, a, it's a different, better way for you to show how you're giving back to the community. Now, the last one is your typical neighborhood battery example. So in this example, this is probably what you've seen in the news when you, when you read articles about community batteries, it's usually this layout. Now, this involves connecting a battery to a distribution transformer. And because we've only got four weeks out till the submission, it's probably too late if you haven't already started to try and get one of these up and running. So we'd advise you not to do this unless you've already started. Um, so that's the three examples that I'll show you. Now, keep in mind, this is a template. These are just examples of how it could be set up. Uh, but using this sort of template, you can actually identify exactly who you need and who you need to bring together and what sort of ob objectives you want. And it gives you the basis for your business model. Now, how VPP partners can help. Uh, what we've done is we've come up with a five-step plan uh, for you to follow, and that's going to make it quite easy for you to get to a cogent submission. So step one, find benefits for you in the community. It's pretty obvious, but it's essential that there are benefits for the community and for yourself. You've got to show that your business model is going to work for you as well. One of the requirements of the grant is to do a sensitivity analysis, which will show you, well, which, which should show the financials with and without the grant. Um, now, if you need help with that, we have a number of templates that we can provide that will help you identify these benefits. Step two, analyze the community batteries. So we've got Orchestra on the call. Orchestra is a software that you can use to do all of the analysis on the business models. If you need help with that, we can help you run the software, um, but you will need to have a techno commercial analysis done. Step three, estimating the costs. Now, in order to understand how much funding you require and how much how successful this project's going to be, you have to have a really, really good understanding of the cost. Our partners 
on this webinar, supply partners are probably the best people to reach out to and Evergen um, as well to find out how much it's going to cost to set everything up. Uh, we can provide you with a template for the budget, uh, but you really have to go out to the rest of the partners to get the exact costs. Now, step four, prepare your submission. It's really, really simple, but you need to make sure you have the resources to actually get everything down into that submission. Um, step five is checking that we meet the objective. So this is a service that we provide. If you use all of our templates to put together the submission, we can come in and make sure the sub submission you have meets all of the requirements. And uh, as part of that, we will also offer some additional phone support. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to us and ask. Um, now, I'm almost done. Last slide. So as Wade mentioned at the start of this webinar, uh, we are also the Tinder for batteries. <laughs> I, think, I think that's what that's how Wade referred to it. But, but actually what we're doing is, is over the last few weeks, while talking to potential proponents of this um, EOI, we've realized that a lot of companies out there and a lot of participants don't actually have everything they need. They've got parts of, parts of it, but they don't have enough sites or they may not have a community to work with. Um, there are various things that might be missing from the, um, from the submission. So we can help you with that. We've come up with this really easy way for you to connect to the right stakeholders. All you have to do is drop us an email. Um, so send an email to communitybatteries at vppartners.com. All you have to do is write, we're interested. Don't, you don't have to tell us anything about the project at this stage. We just need your contact details. We will send you a form that you can fill out. And in that form, we will ask for all of the information we require in order to do the matchmaking. Um, Step three, we'll analyze your responses and come up with uh, how we can help you with your project, but also what sort of partners to connect you to. And then we'll come back to you if you decide you want to go ahead with matchmaking, matchmaking for a small fee, we will make the connection. Uh, now, just a note on that, for the community groups and the NGOs, uh, there is no fee. We, we, we're doing that uh, free of charge just to basically help them out. Um, so that's it. That's me. I will just leave you with this information. So if you have any general inquiries about the EOI, you can reach us at hello at vppartners.com. But if you want to take part in the matchmaking or you want access to the templates, please reach out to us on communitybatteries at vpp.com. So that's it. Um, that's me. Thank you. Back to you, Wade. All right. That's brilliant, Mark. Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate what you have put together over there at VPP Partners. Uh, you're definitely going to make everybody's life a hell of a lot easier. And who knows, they might even find love. And a reminder, if you have any questions directly for Mark, please put them in the Q&A to be answered at the end of the webinar. Uh, Mark's partner in crime, Charles, is active in the chat room right now. So if you need any questions answered right away. He is definitely more than capable. <clears throat> okay, so moving along, our next presentation is from Orchestra, and that will be on the what and hows of modeling these batteries. And that will be from Mr. James Alston. James, please take it over, my friend. Thanks very much, Wade. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, community batteries from a funding perspective and a feasibility modeling perspective so that you can uh, really optimize these projects for the maximum chances of success um, when you're submitting these applications. Um, so one of the challenges that many um, parties are going to be having is trying to trying to ass assess these batteries and understand how they're going to um, generate a return. Um, and we've developed a software solution over the last few years, which is really perfectly placed to be able to do this. So I'm just going to share screen here. Okay. So the, what I'm going to cover today is what constitutes a good project from a funding perspective. And, um, uh, you know, this is really looking at um, what ARENA's got to put, put in place to, um, to try and encourage you to submit projects. Um, 
really trying to unpick that and and understand how you can uh, you can meet arenas drivers. Then we're going to talk a little bit about feasibility modeling of community batteries and how you can best use the funding and think about how to actually develop projects that are really going to be very very impactful. And then finally, a little bit around how orchestra can help, um, uh, specifically um, dealing with some of the challenges that proponents are going to be facing in the next few weeks, um, trying to pull these projects together. Um, orchestra can kind of like move a few barriers out of the way and get you moving really, really quickly. So Arena has put forward that you can um, have a, a, a project. Um, they were looking for, for granted um, uh, basically looking for people to come forward and and ask for between three and twenty million dollars across five projects and they've and they've put this thing in their in their um sort of overview of the program, which is they'll cover up to one hundred percent of the battery capex. And I think that's been a bit of a red herring for many of the people that we've been talking to. I think there's a lot of proponents out there thinking they're going to get a battery for free. Um, I've worked on arena applications in the past, um unsuccessful ones, and they've been unsuccessful because the proponents, uh, haven't been thinking about how to use the funding um, really effectively to try and drive really big projects. And one of the sort of hints that I would encourage you to think about in the way that Arena likes to think and it likes to sort of, you know, promote itself is um, the amount of funding that they've managed to unlock for each dollar that they put in. And they talk about this thing called funds leveraging, which is where for every dollar that they put in, they're going to get a co-contribution from some other party um, towards, you know, um, towards the projects that they're actually funding. And so if you look at like the history of this, and this is, you can go and find it in the most recent um, arena and funding investment plan for every dollar that they've been investing um, from arena, they've got, you know, over $3 being invested by, um, you know, the wider community um, into these, into the projects that they're putting, um, they're putting forward for, for uh, investment. And if you look at just the project deployment um, amount of that funding, it's one to six. So, you know, for think of that as like, you know, physical assets that are going in for every dollar that they're putting in, um, they're seeing sort of six dollars of co-contribution. So when you're thinking about the type of project that you're trying to put together here, the absolute bare minimum, um, which arenas that sort are of putting forward is $3 million. That would be where you get 100% of the battery um, capex funded. But I think a more realistic minimum for, for proponents to be thinking about is a $12 million um, uh, program of works. That is a lot of money that needs to be deployed. But it's really like if you're, if you're trying to optimize your application for success, that's the scale of the type of project you need to be thinking about. So I've put a little sort of example of how to think about a portfolio solution. And um, and so when you're, as a proponent, trying to think about how you could put this uh, your program together, um, I've, I've kind of sort of taken this this $12 million as sort of a reference point and thought, okay, well, what is it, what does it, it mean to kind of build a project of this size? So if you had five sites, that would be $2.4 million per battery. That would get you um, probably a, a, a 2.6 megawatt hour battery 1.3 megawatts if it was a two-hour battery. And that's the sort of battery that would be deployed at a community energy park. So um, Mark Slides, he talked about the behind the meter and the front of meter um, opportunity. Um, that front of meter opportunity is really, we think the best opportunities are there are going to be ones that um, you've got a you know some kind of um, small-scale solar um, but grid-connected solar farm, and you're co-locating a battery with that. And that's we see that as being a pretty, a pretty uh, you know, relatively straightforward um, opportunity to, to get set up. Then when you go above that and you start looking at 10, 20, 50, 100 sites, um, you need to sort of go back and work back to sort of what it would be the funds deployment um, for that $12 million. And you start getting into quite large numbers of sites. Now, it's, I think it's really important to remember that at this EOI stage, you don't need to have all your sites nailed down. So you need at least five EO, um uh, five letters of attend from uh, from each of these sites. But if you're thinking about a massive program of works where you're trying to deploy, you know, 20, 50, 100 um, different projects, what you need to be um, probably starting with that five or 10 or whatever it is, and then showing a pathway to those other sites that you're having conversations with, you know, uh, you know, some uh, education department, if it's schools or, you know, you've, you've got a, an engagement with the uh, a council, or you're talking to an embedded network operator and you're helping set up these projects within an embedded network operator. So I think you just need a pathway to these things. You don't need to have all the solutions and all the answers now down today. So when you're modeling these projects, 
I think the other thing to sort of think about when you're doing this, and this is like this this happens a lot. We've we've seen this a lot at at um at orchestra in my previous um consultancy, where people would get focused on the funding and be like, oh, I can be able to reduce my costs, and I'm going to be able to pay for this battery. That is that's the really the wrong approach to be thinking about these. And I want to sort of give you a couple of ways to sort of think about when you're modeling these projects and you're setting them up, how to actually um set them up for the biggest chance of success. And what I strongly encourage you to do is to think about how you build a viable value revenue stack and focus on getting as much revenue as possible for these batteries and the and use the grant funding for de-risking the project just a little bit. And I'll show you how you can do that in the next couple of slides. So um, I'm gonna, before I get to those slides, sorry, I want to just explain, I'm going to use a, a use case example here. So I've given a, um, this is actually one of the smaller of that range. So this is where you probably need um, you know, around 100 sites of this size, um, but this this uh, this um, uh, this use case is applicable to pretty much any behind the meter um, battery um, in a in a sort of community context. I've, I've called it a vanilla behind the meter battery with a community flavor. So within Arena's um, funding guidelines, they talk about different types of batteries that are kind of relevant for funding. And in the glossary, they've got a definition of what a behind the meter battery is. And they give a they live a list of examples of the types of sites that would be applicable for that. So that's, you know, retirement villages, um, uh, social housing, um, council facilities, community facilities, so things like sporting grounds, et cetera, bus depots, even hospitals is listed as an option, schools, obviously. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that falls into that bin of behind the meter. So I would, you know, strongly encourage you to think about how you do that. So for this particular example, we've got a school, about 120 kilowatt um, uh, maximum demand for this for this site with a 260 megawatt hour load. It's a, you know, reasonably decent sized school. Um, I've suggested that there would be existing solar on this site, have an export limit of 30 kilowatts, which is pretty common for this type of application. And the revenue stack for this one would actually be um, demand charge reduction. That forms the basis of the value stack. And, and um, Evergen and I are 100% aligned on this, which is that the, de the demand charge reduction will form the foundation of your value stack. And it's really critical that you nail that down first. And then on top of that, you're going to um, you're going to add um, the wholesale market arbitrage and potentially contingency FCAS as well. Of which, of of those three different things, those are increasing levels of difficulty to obtain. So you might just start off with demand charge reduction and wholesale market arbitrage, and then step up to within time to to the contingency FCAS if if you need to. Um, but yeah, I think really you need to be looking at a value stack that includes both of those to start with. So this is probably one of the more technical slides that we'll look, be looking at today. Um, so we've got uh, um, uh, some uh, three different charts here where I'm showing how um, as you um, add more value to your project by increasing the number of value streams that are in it. So we start off with demand charge management as being the sort of foundational part of it. And then we add wholesale market arbitrage and we add contingency FKS. When you do that, some some really good things happen. So the first good thing happens is that the projects get more valuable. So you can see that the the optimal net present value, which is a measure of project value and a way that you can compare these different projects, actually increases as you add those different um, different options. But you also see that the the optimal project size also increases as well. So the key message here is as you add more revenue streams to your battery, you're going to get bigger projects. Bigger projects means more capital deployed. More capital deployed means a greater chance of, of having a successful application. So it's really critical to kind of work through this approach and try and make sure that you've got a pathway to more revenue and be able to add add things in. These are, you know, this is a classic revenue stack, but there might be other things that you might add to this revenue stack as well. So backup power is a common one where someone will um, have an application where if they're if the power goes out, um, you know, it's very expensive for them to to um, you know, they can't run the business or they can't, you know, run a particular site and that, that there's real material cost to that. That'd be another way of adding additional value to this, um, to this, to this value stack. So you really got to think about this, um, this revenue stack and try and build towards this. On the funding side, and um, the funding has a similar sort of effect, but in a slightly different way. So um what you really encourage you to look about uh, look to with your projects is not trying to get the grant funding to cover the 100 percent of the cost as we've kind of identified that's a that's a fool's errand you're gonna you end up with an unsuccessful application almost certainly what you need to be looking at is is using the funding to de-risk your projects so um if we look at the um the middle case that I had before so we've got our demand charge management plus wholesale market arbitrage and we add 25 percent grant funding 
And then we look at the return for the, these projects and we look at the um, the return of a 40 kilowatt hour battery without funding and then the return of a um, 70 kilo, uh, sorry, 70 kilowatt, 140 kilowatt hour battery. Um, we can see that if we match those two points on the curve and we look for the same return, we're actually able to double the size of the project by de-risking a little bit. Um, so this is, you know, might not necessarily get the optimal net present value, but like you actually be able to deploy a lot more capital. You actually get a, you know, more likely to 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 get to the sort of scale that you need to do from a smaller number of sites. So this is the way to sort of think through um, how to use um, the funding really effectively to get, um, you know, much much bigger impact in your project. So how can orchestra help with all this? Because obviously to get those slides, I, I ran I ran that orchestra to, to generate the information to to. To prepare those slides, it was literally about half an hour of work for each of those slides. It's super fast to be able to to be able to set up projects and and get through and test a lot of different iterations. So Orchestra is extremely powerful. I've been able to test, you know, literally hundreds of different um, permutations of project um, all at the same time. So you can test different. Um, different battery sizes, you can diff test different control profiles, you can look at the effective grant funding, things like that. So it is, it is, and it's literally minutes to be able to do it. Um, it's, uh, it's a really highly effective way of being able to quickly work through all your sites. Um, a common thing is <laughs> what happens if I don't have any data? So you might be, I had a call with a, a community group um, just this week where they're like, oh, we've got this project, we'd love to do it. We've got, we think we've got 14 sites, we can get the bills for those sites, but we haven't got any load data. Okay, well, <laughs> you're going to need it. Um, probably going to need it within the OFAs, but it's not the end of the world if you don't have it. We do have a lot of um, existing load profiles within Orchestra that you can use to get yourself going, um, to at least do the preliminary modeling to understand um, what sort of returns you might be getting um, before you, you, and then you could even use that as evidence to take to, to um, these sites and say, hey, this is a really good opportunity, guys. We should be thinking about a project here. Um, so, you know, you can use this information quite effectively. Um, and you can go through and you can actually eyeball all the different um, load profiles within the software as well and try and think about, okay, well, this is a site that's, you know, got a probably going to have a commercial load profile that everyone gets there at 8.30 and they leave at 5. And, and you can like try and eyeball, you know, particular particular sites that are similar. Um, when it comes to the to the controls, it's very fast to like set up um, different value stacks and um, different what we call control profiles, which is basically the control software like Evergen is going to be providing or similar to Evergen. Whoever's going to be your market participant may also have their own proprietary system. Um, so it's very easy to kind of like toggle on different value streams um, within the software and actually see, um, you know, to be able to compare the differences of the different value streams and, and how they'll add to your battery. Um, you know, you will, you're going to need to be able to um, talk to why your battery works, both to the people that um, are going to have the battery at their site, um, but also to Arena. Um, within our software, there's um, there's about 20 or two dozen different um, charts and, and assets that you can use. So you can have a look at load profiles before and after. You can generate bills. You can generate cash flow um, charts. You can look at earnings breakdowns uh, and, and really be able to get into the nitty gritty of a project, including right down to the interval level where you can kind of analyze and understand what's actually going on with this battery and why is it doing things in the way that you would expect it to, um, you know, really trying to unpick why, why it's operating in, in this in its particular way. So looking at, um, you know, how is it chasing value? One minute it might be going after trying to reduce demand and the next minute it'll be going after a wholesome market event and you can kind of un understand what's going on within the software. Um, when you need to finally submit your projects, Obviously, when you're doing it in orchestra, it's all stuck in the software. So you need to be able to now submit a um, a financial model uh, to, uh, to to Arena so that they can assess your projects and understand what's going on. Um, what we've done is we've created a um, a template for this financial model where you can um, export the inputs that that we have like a CSV of all inputs that you can um, get out of the out of the software. There's an export for the cash flows. Um, you can then just copy and paste the relevant information into this template. And then um, you can use this to adjust your grant funding. Um, you can adjust the CapEx and OPEX amounts after you can add contingencies. It's not a fully dynamic model. So, um, you know, uh, Arena has asked for a fully dynamic model, including dyna dyna uh, having a dynamic model around the revenue streams. Our professional view is that is absolutely not possible. <laughs> we built Excel models to try and model batteries um, and do the revenue modeling. We think it is categorically not possible. The Excel just cannot do it. So this, in our view, is the best solution to, to that problem where you can use the software to model the, 
um, the revenue, and then you take the cash flows and you put them into this type of Excel spreadsheet, which will allow you to make small adjustments. So understand the effect of grant funding and no grant funding, and adjust capex, adjust contingencies, and be able to present, um, you know, essentially a, a um, an Excel, um, you know, mod- a dynamic uh, model to 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 arena. So, um, what's some key takeaways from this? Um, be modest with your grant funding us. <laughs> Obviously, you've got to hit that $3 million. Um, If you could do a $20 million program, that's awesome. Um, but at the, uh, don't go in thinking that um, that Arena is going to pay for all your batteries and 100% of your battery capex. Uh, that will almost certainly lead to an unsuc- unsuccessful application in our view. Um, be ambitious with your project sizes. So try and push up, use the funding to push up your project sizes, build really um, detailed value stacks because that's going to get to bigger, bigger projects. Um, bigger projects is probably going to lead to greater chance of success. As Mark has said, um, it's going to be the behind the meter projects at this point, which are going to be um, much likely, more likely to be get off the ground than the front of meter ones. If you are going to go for front of meter, then go for that sort of community energy farm approach where you have a you know solar farm and you're going to co-locate a battery with it. Um, don't recommend going down um, the route of trying to get a distribution connected um, battery. Um, there's a report on Orchestra's website. We wrote a 200 page report for um, the uh, Central Victorian Greenhouse Alliance on exactly that model and all the flaws of it and all the challenges of it. Highly recommend you stay away from it. It's going to be an absolute nightmare. And then finally, um, you, uh, we really recommend that you use Orchestra to to identify these and these projects. Um, so you can identify the projects, you can assess them for um, for the for the revenues and for their returns, um, and to be able to use Orchestra to then communicate the the value of these projects to all the stakeholders that are involved. Um, there's a 21 day free trial, so you can. If you're clever, you can use that trial for your advantage um, to to model these projects. Obviously, I'd encourage you to 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 sign up as well, um, but you'll probably need this software as you um, as you head into making full applications anyway. So, thanks very much for um, being able to be present to you today. Um, head off to our website to to find that template. Um, you'll find a blog on our on our website that um, links to that template, and uh, and yeah, look forward to seeing you guys in the tool. Okay. Thank you very much, James. As always, I am completely blown away by what you all have built there. All right, so it is now time for my presentation. I will share my screen. Okay, let me just get rid of that thing at the top if I could. There we go. Okay, so we've done the the who and the how. Uh, Let's get on to the what. So what is an ideal battery? solution for this round one funding and what does that look like i think it's just my keyboard that isn't working so an ideal battery firstly it must have a minimum of 50 kilowatt power output with a maximum of five megawatt and because orchestra's feasibility modeling will give us the solution that makes the most financial sense for the customer having a solution that is modular is best so that we can have multiple options for optimization. Obviously, the more capability the battery has for adding value to itself is necessary. So just having the ability to control the loads and do peak shaving or uh, demand reduction and provide backup when the grid fails, those are the basic necessities and what James said, sort of the backbone of the majority of these battery solutions. But if the battery also has the ability to integrate with market services and VPP, i.e. those wholesale market arbitrage and FCAS, while it does add a big technical component and it has a lot of moving parts to it, it can really, as you saw, pump up the value and return on those batteries. Some other things that are important, just having a fully integrated solution that is easy to install and comes from one supplier, so no one's pointing their fingers at each other should anything go awry, is very important. Having the ability to install it indoors and out, so it gives you that flexibility of installation is key as well. Having a trusted and reliable supplier and supply chain 
so that you can bring these plants online and on time is also very important. And having a solution that has a proven track record here in Australia and also support on the ground here in Australia. All these need to be considered when choosing an ideal battery to run with during your application process. So due to those reasons, we have chosen the SunGrow CNI Best solution. So why SunGrow? Well, SunGrow is the world's most bankable inverter brand. They have 100% bankability for the last four years running. They're also the global number one PV inverter installed last year. So they have capacity. SunGrow also have two warehouses here in Australia, which is important for logistics. And they have over 50 in-house support staff and engineers, which is, I can speak to experience, key when you roll out these, these best deployments. They also have many battery options in both the utility and CNI size solutions. They have over 2.9 gigawatt hours of best deployed worldwide with 800 megawatt hour of that here in Australia. So they are proven here in Australia. The first solution I'd like to show you is their small stack CP series, which is probably the most diverse range. Now, it does come with a 10 year warranty. They are a modular design, so the PCS starts at 50 kilowatt, which is the minimum that the arena funding requires as well. That battery cabinet has anywhere from 101 to 129 kilowatt hours, and you can have two of those cabinets on the one PCS for up to 258 kilowatt hours. It is expandable as well, up to one megawatt of power and five megawatt hours of energy. They are made with safe and reliable LFP cell chemistry. They are very fast in their commissioning and they're easy to install. They have C5 anti-corrosion. So this is important because most of us live on the coastline. So these can be installed co close to the coastline. SunGrow does not yet have a built-in EMS. They are working on it and it is coming soon. So a third party EMS is required to control these batteries and they are cloud-based control ready. So a third-party control mechanism like our Evergen that we'll be talking later today, they will be able to do all the control of the battery from remote operations, monitoring, and error maintenance as well. They are IP54 rated, so that's important for both indoor and outdoor installations. They have HVAC built into them, so keeping that climate control perfect at the 25 degrees that the batteries and the inverter love for, for longevity, and they are built in with fire suppression. So this series, this small stack range of CP will cover a lot of the behind the meter types of solutions we are talking about today. But if you need something that's a bit larger, then they have the power stack series within this this series range as well. They also come with the full 10 year warranty protection, are modular as well, but much larger. So the PCS on this is 250 kilowatt, and that one battery cabinet has 537 kilowatt hours. And again, you can have two of those in parallel on the one PCS, giving you just slightly over one megawatt hour with almost unlimited expandability as well. Again, safe and reliable LFP chemistry. These are have an intelligent liquid cooling system, so that is going to increase the efficiency and life expectancy of the batteries. They've come fully pre-assembled. The cabinets are pre-assembled, so there's no battery module handling on site. Makes it very fast and very easy. Same cloud-based control ready for your third-party EMS and and party like Evergen for remote control of those batteries and monitoring and maintenance as well. Same IP54 rating for both indoor and outdoor applications. So SunGrow and Supply Partners have also paired specifically for Arena to bring you special pricing on these series. So please reach out to us. What are the other CapEx costs that need to be considered for this funding? There are certain things that you can and cannot include, and we will go over those that you can. So obviously the battery system itself, but also any componentry required to connect it to the site can be included. The third-party 
Energy management system for control of the battery and communication with all other assets on site can be included. Any earthworks that are needed, so construction costs or essential ancillary structures and services that need to be installed by licensed trade people, that can all be included as well. The purchase and or development of IT systems that are essential for the operation of that battery, like Evergen. Any acquisition costs, like your freight or your storage, and of course, installation and commissioning costs can all be included. And also any measures to address public safety, such as mitigation of fire or noise or damage, those, those can be included as well. There are many other development costs and soft costs associated with the installation of a community battery that you cannot include in your pack, CapEx costing, but they must be included in the overall project costs. So what's next? How can you, what can you do today to be a part of this expression of interest stage? Well, the first thing you got to do is reach out to those sites that you already know of or the ones that we've talked about today and find those ideal candidates and types of projects and approach them for letters of intent. You then want to align yourself with VPP partners because they're going to help you analyze and build the benefits of those sites. You then want to align with Evergen because they will help determine the opportunity of adding value to each one of those batteries. Obviously using orchestra to build out those feasibility models for each site and then reaching out for, to supply partners for the costing and timeframes of your solutions. You then have to use the templates to prepare your submission and we also recommend that once you have that ready that you go back to VPP partners and let them audit your submission to potentially increase the probability of the success of that. Okay, that is my presentation done. Um, our last presentation will be from Evergen and Rakesh will be presenting on the operational control and monetization of community batteries. And do I need to do anything, Luke? No, okay, I think we're good. Go. Thanks very much, Wade. Hi, everybody. Lucky last, um, but I promise you, I will try and make this as exciting as it possibly can be. Um, can you guys see that bar along the top? I hope you can't. I don't think you can. That's all good. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Rakesh, as Wade and James and Mark have already said. Uh, I'm the head of CNI and Utility Scale here at Evergen, and I'm going to be talking to you about how you actually control and monetize these batteries in practice. Um, Evergen is a software business specializing in battery optimization. We were founded in partnership between CSIRO and AMP Capital back in 2015. So we've been doing this quite a long time and uh, yeah, very excited to be speaking to you today. So let's start with a few operational considerations uh, for, for a battery project such as this. As our other panelists have already alluded to, there's no clear definition of what a community battery actually is. Uh, there's been some spicy blogs written on this topic in the past that I've uh, commented on. Uh, but, you know, generally speaking, we recommend that you focus on batteries with a level of community involvement or shared benefit. Um, but that can and should be interpreted broadly. OK, so this program offers a multitude of opportunities. First of all, there's obvious commercial benefits, as we've already spoken about it's very unlikely that you can just go ahead and do this on your own. So this provides you with the opportunity to learn by doing, develop strategic capability and relationships, and then take these business cases into the future, make them work without grant funding once you've learned what you need to learn. You can obviously access multiple value streams, including FCAS, wholesale market arbitrage, other ad hoc markets, like you know, an example would be the peak demand reduction scheme in New South Wales. That's something that uh, got released recently. And of course, network support. And most importantly, bill reductions through tariff arbitrage and demand charge management. I do agree with what James said earlier. Uh, the bulk of the CNI sort of mid-scale battery projects that you've seen getting off the ground in Australia successfully have been happening where demand charges have been high and predictable, concentrated into a very small portion of the day. So this program provides us with the opportunity to bridge the gap, right? Like residential storage is taken off in Australia. Utility scale storage is also taken off in Australia, but that mid scale size project has not really gone as far as we thought it would. And this program will enable us to understand why. 
front of meter projects, uh, so these are projects that don't have a co-located load, have commercial challenges because they do not have the opportunity to monetize these indirect benefits that we spoke about earlier. And maybe this, this program will help us to work out how we can get there. And finally, we test and learn different business models, uh, testing the commercial viability of different models and applications, um, and most importantly, understanding the regulatory and commercial challenges presented here, including the role of DNSPs, which is a topic that's been discussed at length. So you're going to need a package to come together here and make all of this work, right? What's in that package? The first thing is obviously the correct site or the correct type of land. So you need to be selecting good sites based on community benefit, optimal load profile, and most likely high demand charges. Uh, your sweet spot here is going to be demand charges that are concentrated into a small portion of the day where your load profile is at its peak, right? If you have that, you've got yourself a unicorn project and you're going to be paying back as quickly as you possibly can with some certainty because obviously demand charges are quite predictable. You then need someone to help you finance the project, an engineering procurement construction contractor to bring it all together for you and someone to do operations and maintenance for you as well. There are some innovative outfits out there. I'm sure supply partners have got solutions like these where there's power purchase agreement type mo uh, models that they adopt so that there's limited upfront capex for the customer that owns the site because obviously you know land is at a premium these days if you've been reading the news um, and having access to that land is what bottlenecks a lot of people who have capital that they want to deploy. You then need market participants. Okay, so these are topics, I, I, can't, I can't count the number of people we've spoken to over the last couple of years who have come to us thinking after reading one article in Renew Economy that they can just install one battery and that it's all gonna work off the ground. It is incredibly complicated. You need somebody to face the market for you if you want to monetize your asset in contingency FCAS, in wholesale arbitrage, some people have come to us talking about wholesale demand response. Uh, this is quite a complex market. It's quite new. And there's, there's obviously a few businesses that have been successful in getting portfolios going, but it is quite technically complicated. And what we are finding is that customers with batteries and solar are defaulting to standard wholesale arbitrage rather than wholesale demand response as their means of accessing value in the wholesale market. And of course, it goes without saying, but you need somebody to bring all of this together and make it work in a market agnostic, vendor agnostic, participant agnostic way. Um, you may not have the same market participant across all of your sites. You may not have the same hardware. You may not have the same configuration. That's what our software is built to deal with. And we make use of machine learning to get the best possible outcome for every site that our software is running on. So you absolutely do need someone like us because the Australian market is very complicated. As of the end of this year, there's going to be across just the wholesale market and the contingency FCAS markets, there's going to be nine different markets that are behind the bat meter battery could be bid into um, in five minute intervals. I don't think you want a person to be making those decisions on an ongoing basis. So how can we help? Evergen provides an end-to-end -end platform for DER management, making use of machine learning to get the best possible outcome, reduce total cost of ownership, and ultimately accelerate the transition to renewables across the world. We've been doing this for a very long time. We've got 12,000 batteries under management in Australia today, and we are operational in nine countries. We are cloud first, cloud native, no additional hardware required in order to control a battery and make all of this work. As Wade alluded to earlier, you know, the SunGrow battery comes with a third party EMS. This tends to be a power plant controller of some description that is taking care of the circuit level of safety and monitoring on site. We can embed ourselves into anything like that. Oh, there's my dog. Uh, we can embed ourselves into anything like that if you want um, and make it work. You can choose any hardware manufacturer as long as the device is connected to the internet. That's all we need. Um, we also provide, as you know, tariff and market agnostic optimization. The only tariff that we can't optimize against is a flat tariff because it is flat. Aside from that, we can optimize against absolutely anything. It is multi-market optimization, classified as greedy to get the best possible financial outcome from every interval. We make use of algorithms to learn from your load, learn from your PV generation patterns as well, and then predict what the best outcome of the best action should be that a battery should be taking at any given time based on what's coming later. And we also give proponents the ability to override the optimization. So if you're part of a big portfolio and you need to take a portfolio level action, uh, you are obviously allowed to do that. Ultimately, it's your battery, it's your site, and our software enables you to do anything you want to. 
We have bidding integrations with the market. So if you've got a market participant that's providing you with access to the FCAS market, we can do the bids for you. Uh, we can also feed availability data to somebody else's bid platform if that's needed. Pretty flexible. We've also got access to dynamic operating envelope programs, which are starting to take off despite the term really annoying me. Uh, it's just flexible exports. But uh, we have those integrations with various DNSPs across the country and other VPP programs as they come, we will be able to access. The key message here is flexibility. <clears throat> what you do today is not going to be what you do in five years time. And it would be a huge mistake to think that that is going to be the case. In addition, we have monitoring, um, alerting and reporting as well, but I won't talk too much about that. So how this works in practice, let's use the example of um, a lifestyle resort that has got some community buildings, some residential villas, uh, potentially EV charging in the future, and you know some PV inverters as well. We will take all of the necessary information from each of these sites, um, and we then take in real-time inputs from outside. That could be a weather forecast, a standard price forecast, or if you've got a retailer or other market participant who's feeding you a price forecast, we can take that in as well, and other energy market data as appropriate. We have market agnostic bidding and rebidding, as we've already spoken about. This has to be taken into account if you're trying to come up with a plan for your battery. And then finally, bringing it all together by an integration with hardware on site or with the vendor cloud, we will be able to create and execute the optimized battery plan based on everything that we have spoken about. Also receiving telemetry and alerts so that you know how your battery is actually behaving. All of this happens every five minutes, looking at the next 48 hours, and every five minutes we um, implement a new rolling 48-hour schedule that gives you the best possible outcomes from your site and obviously matches up with the interval lengths in the Australian market. Once your site's on our platform, it also gets access to the additional platform capabilities that we have. If you'd like to know more, you know where to find me. And what this looks like, I'll give you a couple of examples here and then I will wrap up. Uh, so going back to a slide that Mark presented at the beginning, this is something that we have seen working in the past and this is actually from a, an example customer that we have. Um, the first thing I will say here is that from a regulatory standpoint, this is an incredibly complex layout. Okay, it's an in incredibly complex thing to be um, going for. So I don't know that you would want this to be your first pass uh, for, for some projects like this but it is the way it has been seen to work in the past. So here you've got your grid meter. This is your incomer to the site. You've got a bunch of tenant and house loads and you've got some PV and you've got a battery. So this gate meter can be on a time of use tariff. It can be on a wholesale tariff. It really depends. It doesn't really matter because you've set up an embedded network. It's worth noting that the embedded network framework is very complicated. Um, I can't understate that enough, uh, but that's that's just something you need to be mindful of. But the benefit of it is that it enables you to put a child meter on your battery and expose it directly to the wholesale market. Okay, that's, that's why a lot of people have been doing it. It allows you to treat your battery like a standalone front of meter asset just for the wholesale market. And what our technology can do is read from the load at the incomer to make sure that demand charges are minimized here. That's really important because that's where they're calculated. And prior to the 31st of March of this year, your FCAS market participation would have been logged here as well. But there has been a recent rule change oops, to allow Jesus, uh, to allow small generation aggregators to participate in the FCAS markets as well. Um, I haven't tested this with AEMO myself, worth noting that they have full discretion over the rules, but a read of those rules suggests that your SGA would then be the market participant here. So you do have some flexibility, but hopefully the main takeaway from this is it is not a very simple thing to be doing. And finally, um, what do we what do we actually offer in a nutshell? We offer demand charge management, retail tariff arbitrage, and increased PV self consumption uh, straight out of the box. And then we enable access to wholesale market opportunities and FCAS market participation via a VPP. There's obviously other markets that are going to be coming in the future as well. And that flexibility is absolutely key. It's one of the reasons why a lot of customers come to us now because they don't really know what's going to happen in the future. And they want a platform that's going to be future proofed rather than dogmatic about how they do it today. I'll finish off with a quick example. Uh, there's been a little bit of press about this this week, so I don't know if, uh, if some of you have seen it, but uh, Gemlife are one of, our, one of our key customers. They operate a lot of lifestyle resorts across 
some very nice parts of Australia. Uh, I was up on the Sunshine Coast on Monday. It made me want to be over 50. It was very, very nice. Um, they're rolling out PV batteries and other kind of energy conscious um, assets across all of their resorts over the next you know, 10 to 15 years, really. And they are wanting to reduce grid reliance, reduce emissions, and make better use of the assets that they have on their sites. So there's rooftop solar on each villa, usually several hundred of them. There's rooftop solar on community buildings, maybe one or two. And then there is a central battery energy storage system, a CNI scale battery energy storage system, head per transformer or connection point. And we are the ones doing the optimization for all of these sites. So we take into account the distributed PV, take into account the distributed load profiles, aggregate those together and work out what the battery's uh, schedule should tell it to do. And we implement that across all of their sites. In addition, critically, we will also enable integration of future electric vehicle charging, any type of demand response devices, and generally any Internet of Things technologies with a compatible interface, um, also allowing them to access any retailer they want to for energy market participation. So this is really important as well. They don't have to lock in with a particular retailer to be with us. We can just provide them with maximum flexibility, no matter who their market participant is. That's all from me. Uh, if you'd like to know more, please contact us. You can use this QR code when the slides are sent out later uh, and also type my name into YouTube. I've done some stand up in the past. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Rakesh. I like the, uh, I like the wish to, I was over 50. That was a good one. Hold on. Um, so th that does conclude all the presentations for today. So now we can hop into the Q and A portion. Um, can I see some questions? There we go. All right. Number one from Greg Evergen is your solution open ADR based. Uh, we are API driven. Um, I can get a proper technical answer to that question from somebody uh, that's not me. But as far as I'm, as far as I can tell, I mean, we are we are fully API driven. We're we're able to receive commands from various market bodies, and we have that with AMO at the moment. But I'll get a proper answer to the open ADR question for you as well. Okay, fantastic. And don't go far, Rakesh. The next three are yours as well. So, question for. Evergen from Anonymous, would uh, would we still need a trading algorithm and NEM forecast to sit on top of their software, correct? Uh, look, it depends on what they mean by those phrases. Uh, a NEM forecast, so if you're talking about a price forecast, we do have a price forecast that we use. Um, it's, it's based on AMO pre-dispatch pricing. To be honest, especially for short-term price forecasts, it's hard to find somebody that does a better price forecast than AMO themselves. They have access to data that really nobody else does. They're very good at forecasting demand, which has a major impact on it. But we have the ability to apply sensitivities to it so that you know it's a bit of a BS filter as well. But of course, we have the ability for people to feed their own price forecasts in and run the battery according to what they think is going to happen in the market if they want to. As for a trading algorithm, again, it does depend on what you mean by that. Some of our core customers are traders, so they apply their own domain knowledge to what they expect to happen in the market over the next few a few intervals. Sometimes they take over the keys and just manage things themselves. Um, that's what our platform is built to do. It's built to be light touch, uh, most of the time set and forget, but every now and then on those one or two days of the year where traders make all of their money, they have the ability to take over if they want to. I might add a little bit to that, which is that if you're going to go down the route of using that SGA um, uh, approach and having that child meter, you're not actually going to need to be bidding into the market until you get to a very large scale that you can probably um, get away with just uh, being a price taker rather than a price maker. So yeah, you can kind of avoid that particular um, necessity. That's a, that's a great point, actually, James. Um, so yeah, for the for the size the sizes of sites that we're talking about here, this is something I should have uh, maybe alluded to in my presentation. There's not going to be many people bidding into the wholesale market here, unless you're doing wholesale demand response, which we've already spoken about not maybe being the best idea. You are going to be a price taker. Um, and that's one of the benefits of wholesale arbitrage using behind the meter storage. So maybe the trading algorithm part of it, as James has alluded to, is not as essential, but you may still need somebody with trading chops to try and work out every now and then 
I mean, just to just to conclude there, um, on, on a day when prices are high, what you don't want to be doing is running at the same time as everybody else, flattening your battery. And then when there's a sustained high price, not having enough capacity to take advantage. That's where these types of people with real market smarts come in. And our platform is built for people like them. Uh, you've got to make sure that you've got somebody like that in your corner if you want to get access to markets like that in the future. Okay, Rakesh, keep going? <laughs> yeah, next one for you, buddy, is uh, do you have any batteries under management in central or northern Queensland, i.e. in Ergon? Yes, we do. Um, it's been a bit of a difficult network to really get good penetration in because of the way in which it's structured. But we have been working with Ergon to figure out what the best way is to get more batteries out there. We have some, but we definitely would like more. Okay, one more for you. Um, what retailers are compatible with Evergen? Uh, so we, we're compatible with any retailer. We have some retailers who are customers of ours. I'll have to go and remind myself if, if I'm allowed to name them here. Uh, but I can tell you that we have got a one, one of the top three uh, in the country. And, uh, and we are working with many others as well to provide them with access to the full suite of solutions that we have or just a part of them. Uh, one of our other Cornerstone customers um, is also a tier two retailer um, owned by a major corporate and working in some very innovative spaces who have actually helped us to develop a lot of the features that we have in our platform today. So generally speaking, you can be with any retailer you want and we'll optimize uh, against any what our CEO likes to call flavor of ice cream of optimization that you like, but just the ice cream factory, bring your recipe and we'll execute. Maybe ice cream factories don't say execute, but anyway, there we go. Um, next question, what third party EMS do Evergen recommend for using with the Sun Grow Best? Um, I can't give you a recommendation on that, I'm afraid. All I can say is um, you'd have to talk to SunGrow and maybe supply partners on which piece of hardware would be best suited to um, act as a PPC there. And then if it has a cloud or it's connected to the internet, we can work out how we do that. One day is there, Rakesh, but you already look like you're over 50. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't shaved in a while. Didn't yeah. sleep great. Uh, you right. want to take that next one too? Question for Evergen. Yeah, sure. So we have been told it is mandatory to have high speed metering on site to ensure compliance with FCAS and no risk of fines from AEMO. Uh, yes, that is correct. So we are a software business. Um, technical compliance with the market ancillary services specification is the responsibility of the site. Uh, and once the technical compliance has been met, we do the rest. So yes, you would need high speed metering in order to comply with, uh, with FCAS. Um, we, we don't provide that, but there are many people out there that do. We can we can chat to you about who those people are if you're interested. All are right. we responsible? Sorry, I'll just keep yeah. going. Um, yeah, keep are Evergen, going. Res are Evergen responsible for compliance risks with AEMO, or is this the responsibility of some of the retailers who recognize that platform? Um, look, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. If you're talking about market compliance, then that is the responsibility of your financially responsible market participant, who would be your retailer. Um, they will have billing platforms that are separate to us, but we can integrate with if needed, and they get data directly from their meter data provider, who is also independent of Evergen. So from a compliance perspective, um, it may be linked to the previous question as well. But yeah, there's, in terms of data retention, like we have an autonomous bidding engine for the energy market as well, for the large utility scale sites. So we do meet the compliance requirements within the NER for bidding um, and for data retention but we don't, obviously we're not a retailer, so it's different uh, when it comes to that. And can I confirm that our API access is available to sites for both monitoring and control? Yes, I can. Um, so once a battery is on our platform, then whoever has a right to access its data can have access to our platform to do whatever they need to do. Does anyone else wanna answer some no, questions here? It's, Jeez. It, well, the next tour for orchestra. James, can you see those? Um, the question here is, can you add additional solar as part of the project spend to increase the battery utilization and allow a larger battery? Um, this is a bit of a, yes, <laughs> you can add, certainly add um, solar sizes to your project. You can do look at tariff changes, uh, which is actually a not pretty neat way of um, adding another value to your, to your uh, revenue stream. Um, particularly if you can move a, a site from being a large customer to a small customer, it tends to be quite an effective way of adding more value. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, you can do that. In terms of increasing the value of the project, sometimes um, it highly depends on the correlation of the load and the solar and the tariff and how those three things will interact. Um, you can't logic through it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. As a general rule, it will. Um, so I would just encourage people just to get in there and just start understanding how the, um, those things will interact by using the software. Uh, the next one is, can you model the variability of spot price given the uncertainty of the future market? So we have a number of different um, forward curves that are in the tool. Um, so we use um, the end game economics forward curves, um, which you can use as probably as a starting position. Um, we've also got a whole stack of historical um, uh, NEM data as well. So um, everything from last um, calendar year back, um, the uh, you can use that to do sensitivity analysis. Uh, when you get to the point of it really needing to go to the next level, um, particularly if you're going down the full application route, you may need to engage um, someone like a Cornwall Insight or an Arena, or Aurora Energy Research. They can provide you with four curves. You can load those four curves into the tool and then you can do your feasibility modeling on that and you can check the sensitivities of you know high, medium, low cases. Um, I think at the EOI stage, that's really unnecessary. I would use historical data and I would just pick um, low, medium and high years um, as your uh, as your input data. I'd probably um, recommend that everyone think about using um, uh, 2000, uh, uh, so 2021 um, as their um, reference year, as their base case. Um, it's a good reference year um, and then maybe pick a, a year prior to that for a low case um, uh, 2022 was an outlier. There's a I've got a blog on my website that talks about how much of an outlier um, that was. I think there's heaps and heaps of stuff written about that particular year, but from a battery perspective, um, yeah, very much an outlier, and that would be your very high case. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So I think this next case, I think this um, one, this might have been a bit of a bum steer. <laughs> Wait, sorry, mate. Um, <laughs> I think when you're talking about the the, the capex, um, the three x here is really about the three x of co-contribution. It's not about the soft costs. So when you look at the whole battery um, capex that needs to be deployed, if you're deploying um, twelve million dollars of battery capex, you're looking at three million dollars um, of that funding towards um, that project from uh, from Arena, and the remaining nine is going to come from someone else. So that could be um, the site host may contribute. It might be a in some cases, you might want to do a community fund and have um, the community fund providing that $12 million. Um, It might be a third-party financier, which there's plenty out there. So, um, yeah, you really need to be thinking about funds matching. Um, it's not about the um, so much about the soft costs. The soft costs should be actually quite a small proportion of the total capex of the project. It's really about trying to get as much deployment of capital as, as possible, as I've kind of outlined in my um in my part here. I'm just going to go to some of the answered questions, which I think were really good. Um, I don't know whether everyone has read through um, all the all the ones that are that are in here, but there was a specific question here around, um, could I use this program to get um, batteries on my soft drink manufacturing um, side or um, concrete companies? Maybe. <laughs> um, there's there's nothing that explicitly rules this out within the, within the program, but you're going to need a community angle. Um, our probably suggested approach to this would be using um, a community unit trust or something like that, where you can have um, the local community investing into a unit trust. That unit trust then invests into that um, into that battery, and those um, parties all get a return on that asset. That may be a way that you can kind of do it, um, but yeah, I think uh, I would hazard a guess that Arena is probably looking for stuff that is a bit more community um, focused. So things like schools and. Um, and council facilities, uh, sporting grounds, stuff like that is probably much more in in what they're looking for. Are we going to go? Are we going to look at the next one? Um, some answered questions. Can you clear? Yeah, I might just pick some of the other answered questions. Um, yeah, so just um, Scott Run, I've already answered that one around. Um, you know how we think about the soft cost. Soft cost probably going to be a relatively small part of the of the project. Um, I've already answered that one. In, what is it? Um, so interpreting the community solar benefit, <laughs> this is a this one's a bit tricky in the context of behind the meter. I, I, my view on this is that it's really around trying to get the battery behind the meter to be um, to be absorbing solar as much as possible at the at the site. Um, if you're not pushing energy into the network, that means that you're basically allowing capacity for for everyone else. Um, you when you get down to the sort of um, LV transformer distribution connected. Um, 
uh, type projects, um, you could you know make an estimation of of community solar benefit. Um, I'd refer everyone to the report that we wrote for um, Central Victorian Greenhouse Alliance, which goes into enormous amounts of detail about how to think about this particular problem, um, and and how challenging it is to really make it stack up economically. Um, you know, an example of this was. You know, we looked at a two, a, about 120 different um, LV transformers across PowerCore's network, and we found that many of those transformers were actually 50 kVA or less in size, very small, and serving quite a small number of of um, homes. And in some cases, were just 10 kVA, so extremely small transformers. So if you've got one customer on the street who's um, who's installed a seven you know uh, kilowatt system, that's it. That's it for the whole street. And so there's no capacity to accept any more power on that street. Now, is a community battery really the best solution to be solving that particular problem? Probably not. I would recommend that you just upgrade the transformer for about a tenth of the price. So I'd really encourage people to think about this problem of like, how do we enable more solar um, and try to be try to think of it like quite broadly around what is the best solution. Um, this is where we kind of, again, steer people back towards things that are probably a little bit um, easier to get off the ground, like behind the meter batteries and um, batteries that are co-located with, with uh, you know, community energy projects. So Hepburn Wind Farm is a really good example. They've just been um, released with some funding to, to um, in a non-competitive sense for a battery at their wind farm. Um, that to me is a, is a classic case of a perfect community battery um, in, at a front of meter application. Um, Happy with the rest of them? I think you've tackled the good ones. I've tackled the good ones. Uh, I don't know. Mark Mark might want to go for this one. The energy security considered in the factor of the community solar benefit. Um, no. <laughs> that's a really, that's a bit of a macro question. Um, sure. I mean, I think you can you could take the, you know you can apply any sort of like value and attribute any value to this. Again, I'd refer people back to the report that we wrote. We we thought extensively around um, energy security and the value of energy security. Um, there's lots of um, stuff that AMO provides around the value of particular you know making sure that the network is up and and the value of that to to communities. Um, you could attribute that to your project potentially if you can justify that the battery somehow provides a greater level of reliability. Uh, go for it. Uh, it's it's hard, right? Like it's really hard to make this stuff work. Um, and it's hard to then think about that, all this stuff in the context of applying a control system like Evergen to it and think about like how you might um, how you might operate and control the battery to achieve these particular outcomes. Uh, I, I would just... You know, this, these types of projects where you're trying to use a, a battery to basically pr perform the functions of the grid um, are very tricky to to get together for a whole range of reasons. Um, so I would, again, steer people back towards stuff that is a little bit more vanilla, a bit simpler to get off the ground. You've got four weeks to go to get an EOA in that makes sense, that is cogent, and that has all the different parts that needs to come together. You've got to have a financial model works that works. You've got to have a business model that works. You need all your stakeholders, and you need letters of intent from sites that are going to be happy to do these projects. Sure, if you think you've got one of those projects, give it a crack. I reckon Arena will be keen to try and fund one or two of them. They are extraordinarily difficult to get all those different pieces of the puzzle to come together. So... um. I think we're cash just typing an answer to this one. Do you just want to answer it, bud? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I've just written, you know, there's three things you should never discuss at dinner parties, religion, politics, and reverse flow through transformers and substations, <laughs> right? This is more of a question for the DNSB, to be honest. Uh, but ultimately, having uh, more batteries connected at distribution level will help with the high, with the challenges posed by high penetration of PV which are therefore giving rise to minimum demand challenges that a lot of the DNSPs are facing. I think SAPN were the first ones to really talk about this maybe two or three years ago. Um, I don't really have a view on the topic, uh, but I do know that having more batteries at the distribution level can only can only help. So that was it. All right. It doesn't matter where they are in the distribution level, right? You're, they, they you're can... mute. Correct, yeah. It doesn't matter where they are at distribution level. That's absolutely right. Um, as long as they are connected somewhere. Um, ultimately, that this is why people are putting out solar soak tariffs and things like that, trying to incentivize people to uh, to install batteries. And 
Uh, for whatever reason, the mid-range batteries haven't really taken off, but hopefully this program will help. Okay, we have Charles answering one of those questions. If you have many commercial... Oh, disappeared on me. Uh, sites with high overnight usage are unlikely to benefit from battery arbitrage, but can still provide that solar soaker capability during the day. How do the benefits stack up? I can probably answer that. Yep. Um, so yeah, look, having access to the battery throughout the day is obviously very important. Uh, if you can't benefit from wholesale arbitrage, uh, sorry, let me just go back and see what the question was. Uh, there's there's other markets that you can participate in, right? So there's wholesale there's wholesale arbitrage we've already spoken about. There's also contingency FCAS. There's demand charge management, which we've already spoken about. Um, and then there's access to other markets as well. Contingency FCAS, as an example, you don't actually get paid directly for responding. You get paid for being available to respond. And if there is an event, you uh, have to make good on your obligation. And if you don't respond to that event, then you potentially have to return revenues from the last time you did. So this is the type of like overnight, uh, just you know, being paid for being on standby type model that exists. And if there's limited load on site to support, uh, then it's a perfect thing for you to be doing with your battery, getting paid to be on standby for an FCAS event. Yeah, I'll, I might add to this, which is that <laughs> there's no truisms around um, how you have a load and a tariff and solar interact and the shape of the load. It is highly specific. Um, to every single case as to how they all mix together. So when you talk about having a site with high overnight usage and that a battery is not much use at arbitrage, well, it might not be necessarily used at arbitrage, but actually in a commercial sense, what you're wanting to do is do demand reduction. And it will just depend on the tariff, um, the demand tariff as to whether um, and how that demand tariff is applied as to how valuable it will be for this particular type of site. So um, yeah, I would as a general rule, probably steer you to, towards projects where you've got um, high um, during the day or evening usage, which are sort of coincide with good um, times of high prices in the network and and usually high demand. But you won't know until you get down into the weeds of these projects as to un actually understand how they work, which is why you need software to do this kind of stuff because it's not – you just can't logic through it. I mean, when we were, we wrote a white paper at the start of, you know, um, creating our software – um, which you'll find on the New Energy Ventures website, which looked at the best places in Australia for commercial industrial batteries and VPPs, which is what we're talking about here today. And we we started off like trying to guess the answers every time we do it. So we had 240 different permutations of projects. In the end, we just like, look, we just got to stop trying to pre-guess it. You can't, you can't logic through. There's just too much going on with all the different things between the load and the solar and the tariff and the markets and everything. You just can't guess the answer. There's some rough rules of thumb, but at the end of the day, you need to use, you need to, to be modeling these projects to really understand um, whether they're going to make sense or not. Okay. And there's only one last question, James, and that, what is the title of the orchestra report? <laughs> uh, I think the, I mean, there's, um, the one that I was referring to on the community batteries, the, probably the best way to find it is there's a um, is to head to our blog. Um, down there, you'll find um, uh, two um, uh, articles. One um, talking about uh, um, I think it's called Five Reasons for Caution on Community Batteries, which is specifically to, um, when we talk about that, it's the the sort of LV connected um, transformer connected batteries. Um, another one looking at the um, at uh, just generally a, a summary of the report. Um, and if you click into one of those blogs, it'll give you a link to the report in there. Well, Jeff came in at the last minute. Have you fed back on opportunities in the NT where the government owns the retailer, distributor, and generator with flat rates? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we we can support you with uh, projects in the NEM and then the WEM. Um, we probably can support you um, in the, in NT as well, but um, yeah, you would have to. You would basically be having to build a project up from the ground up. There's just there's not. We don't have the same kind of libraries of of um, market data and tariffs that we can support you in the other markets. Okay, well, thank you. Um, that. That'll bring the webinar to a close. I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Again, a copy of this will be sent to everybody who registered. I would like to thank our guests, Rakesh from Evergen. Thank you very much. Mark from VPP Partners and James from Orchestra. Thank you. James, I believe our podcast drops next week as well. So anybody who wants to know a lot more about Orchestra, definitely listen to that. And thank you again.